What a powerful name it is. My sin was great. Your love was greater. That's wonderful. Come on, Bitsam. Almachtig en eeuwige Vader, Jere, u wat was, u wat is, en wat tot in eeuwigheid sal wees. We worship and praise you this morning as our Father in heaven. We praise you as our Creator, as the great I am that you are. We praise you and we worship you for your love and your mercy. We worship you for your faithfulness, Lord in spite of our own unfaithfulness. Here by you, bly ons veilig. Maak die saak nie. Here, you vergeef us steeds ons sondes. Ons kan elke keer na, na u toe terugkeer en sê, Vader, wees my genadig. You renew us, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Yet, you know how frail we are, Lord. Please forgive us for blending in with the world around us to the point of invisibility. Lord, forgive us for hesitating whenever we need to praise you, to uplift you, to represent you. Lord, you are also so intimately aware of our struggles on this earth, the pain we have, the despair. Lord, you know about those that are going through chaos right now, chaotic situations, that are living in fear whose hearts are confused at this moment and wondering why is this happening to us. My prayer this morning, Lord, is that you will come to them, Lord, in a tangible way. Lord, I'm thinking in particular of Auntie Anne Dawi's family. Comfort them through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I'm thinking of our brother in Burundi and all other people who have taken ill at this time, Lord. Come with your healing hand, touch them, Lord, that they would feel the power of the Spirit as it moves through them once again. That they be strengthened, Lord, that they become soldiers of the cross again. I also pray for those in authority, Lord, as we are living in a country where sometimes that's where our despair comes from, Lord. We've had some municipal elections and we've had lots of confusion with hung councils and stuff. Come, Lord, come speak to those in authority. Let it be about us, the people of South Africa. Let it be about the prosperity of the land. Give them your mind, Lord. Surround them with godly counselors and direct their paths. And this morning as we await to hear your word being read to us, your word being preached, it is my prayer, Lord, that you will give us Samuel's ear, an open ear, Lord, so that we will hear your word, but more than that, that we will become doers of your word, as St. James has urged us to do. Be with those, Lord, who would read your word. Be with him who will preach your word, Lord. Strengthen him as we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.
Good morning. We're reading from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads, and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Does that get you thinking? That's been just the point of these movies that we've been watching for the past six weeks in our Life Explored course down the road at the yellow coffee shop. Each week has presented a video like this to get us thinking and pondering. And then there's been a teaching video just to help us to think through the big questions of life. And we wanted to round that off here today together in this seventh week of Life Explored. For those of you who attended and for those of you gathered today, we thought it would be a good thing and appropriate for us to finish our Life Explored course here on Sunday together. And so I want to stress to you that the talk I'm going to give is normally the talk that's given in the second of the videos at Life Explored. And so it's not original. This is the talk which is given and scripted, which we're given to give. And we can choose to do that in person or on the video. And so that's what is before us in the subject of the joyful God, the joyful God. What is the best gift God could give you? Has been the burning question of this whole Life Explored series. In 2014, a group of artists and musicians in England asked thousands of people one question and based a show on its answers. The question was, what is your happiest memory? What is your happiest memory? I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that with the person next to you or behind you. What is your happiest memory? Have a quick chat as, uh, as you think about your happiest memories, and then we'll continue. Well, when the answers came in for this show, there were lots, of, of course, of first dates and first answers and first loves. Memories of weddings and births, memories of the holidays, the faces of loved ones now lost. As they collected these memories of happiness, they noticed three things. The first was that less than 1% of the happy memories had anything to do with material things, with stuff that could be bought. Secondly, the memories were nearly always about relationships of one kind or another families or friends or lovers. And they discovered a third thing when they fed all the happy memories into the computer. It was a celebration. Sorry, this is it. The word that came up most often was the word home. The director said that the shows ended up being a cross between a wedding and a wake. 
It was a celebration mixed with sadness because these were memories of happiness, but the happiness had gone. It hadn't lasted. What was left was a longing for relationship and a longing for home. So why do we have these desires? The author C.S. Lewis said, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. We were. Open up Revelation chapters 21 and 22, and you can do that if you have your Bibles, and I'll read a bit in a moment, but you'll catch there a stunning glimpse of the world you were made for. The reason why our earthly homes and our earthly relationships never fully satisfy, not even the best ones. The Bible calls it the new heaven and a new earth, the kingdom of heaven, or simply heaven, a universe of perfect joy, perfect happiness, and perfect love. It's a world where we experience both the ultimate home and the ultimate relationship that deep down we've longed for all of our lives. So have a listen to a part of that in Revelation 21 from verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more and neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Just think of it. What is it that makes home so desirable? Comfort, acceptance, refreshment, rest, being with those we love, protection from everything that threatens those things. That's the biblical picture of heaven. All the suffering, rejection, exploitation and loneliness, it's dealt with, removed. Everything sad comes untrue. All that happened in Genesis chapter 3 is undone. The garbage is dealt with and the glory is restored. But this isn't earth written off and replaced with something completely different. This is the earth renewed, healed, restored, and filled with people who themselves have been renewed, healed, and restored. A new creation filled with new creations, just as real and physical as this creation, but with no more pain, no more crying. No more injustice or unrequited love or cruelty or concentration camps or hospitals or hearses or separation or pandemics. It's a new creation that takes all that is beautiful and joyful in this present life and magnifies it to an infinite degree. Like a book with each new chapter, each new page being even more wonderful than the one before. But heaven isn't just home, the home we've longed for all our lives. It's the relationship we've longed for too. If you read Revelation 21 and 22, and I commend you to do that perhaps through the day later, you'll see that at the beating heart of heaven is a wedding. That love story that began in Genesis chapter 1 reaches its climax. The promise made to Abraham that he would draw to himself a multi-ethnic, multi-racial group from every different social class and background from across every era of history. This is where we see it fulfilled, finally fulfilled. Remember it? Verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The holy city is God's people, a bride, perfectly prepared for her husband. And after the desperate centuries of tragically giving her heart to other lovers, all the spiritual adultery and idolatry, she is made clean, made beautiful, and drawn into the bridegroom's arms. And who's the bridegroom? The husband-to-be? Well, the answer comes just a few verses later. Verse 9 tells us, He's the Lamb. The Lamb is marrying the holy city, Jerusalem. 
Now that's a pretty unusual wedding, isn't it? I've seen some strange wedding ceremonies and traditions in my time over the years. But here we've got a troubled Middle Eastern city getting married to a farmyard animal. That's pretty strange, pretty unexpected, even by biblical standards. But of course, this is a hark back to the Passover, when God's people were delivered from slavery in Egypt. The blood of the lamb, you remember, was put on the tops and the sides of the door frames so that they could escape God's rightful judgment and go free. And when God saw the sign of the blood, he passed over them. And the lamb died so that they didn't have to. That, of course, was an anticipation of an infinitely greater liberation made possible by an infinitely greater Lamb. And so 1,500 years later, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sin of the world, shed His blood on the cross. And all our wrongdoing, all the love we've lavished on created things instead of our loving Creator, He took the punishment for. The Lamb died so that we don't have to. And both the home and the relationship we've longed for all our lives, they're fully open to us. But only because the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, died on the cross in our place. But as with any wedding invitation, as we saw in our reading earlier, many are invited, but not everyone comes. And for many different reasons. That means... As the Bible makes crystal clear, not everyone is included. You see, if heaven is to be heaven, all evil and injustice and wrongdoing must be kept out. That's why twice in these two chapters in Revelation, Jesus refers to those who are shut out from the new heaven and the new earth because of their idolatry. All those who have given their lives to worshipping anything or anyone other than Jesus will be shut out from this glorious presence of him. But we say, come on, Jesus is the only way in? Are you telling me that? It's surely offensive to be so exclusive, so narrow. No one should say that only belief in Jesus will bring us acceptance with God. But friends, how can there be any other way to God when we look at the cost of entry? If there were any other way, why would the Son of God have to pay in death and blood for our spiritual adultery? It's that serious. Only the cross is uniquely able to pay for it. And the Lamb, the Bridegroom, Jesus himself, he died precisely so that we would not have to. He took the punishment we deserve so we wouldn't have to. It was glorious to reflect that in the life of Anne on Friday, who knew and loved her Lord and is now with him because of him. Will we accept the invitation to the wedding? Jesus is holding it out to us here. And he wants nothing less than for you to enter into the joy that exists in God himself. When the French scientist Blaise Pascal died at the age of 39, a small piece of parchment was found sewn into the lining of his coat. It was his handwritten account of the precise moment when, at the age of 31, he experienced a joy unlike anything he'd known before. It was on the 23rd of November, that's two days from now, Monday in 1654. From about half past ten in the evening to about half an hour after midnight. This is what's written on the parchment. Fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of philosophers nor of the scholars. Certainty, heartfelt joy, peace. God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God. Forgetfulness of the world and of everything except God. Joy, joy, joy. Tears of joy. What was happening to Pascal here? As he read his Bible, he had encountered Jesus himself, the joyful God. He was experiencing just a tiny foretaste of what heaven will be like, forgetfulness of the world with all its idols, and in its place, joy. 
You see, if we could see into the heart of God, we would see pure, ever-flowing, never-ending joy. The Father joyfully loves His Son. The Son joyfully loves and serves His Father. The Spirit joyfully makes much of the Father and of the Son. We've seen that trinity of joy, haven't we, in John 17 in that series that Jacques taken us through. Each person of this trinity, other-focused, self-giving, generously pouring himself out unselfishly for the sake of others. It's irrepressible, overflowing like a gushing spring of water. And that's why it says here in the final chapter of the Bible in Revelation 22, 17, let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. Anyone who tastes this joy, the joy at the heart of God, will never again experience an absence of of anything. Complete satisfaction, complete rest, complete happiness. That's the heart of this God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And He is inviting you and me to share in it, to drink from it. Can you see how staggering this is? No other God is like this God. And that means the greatest gift God could possibly give you is himself. And that is what he does through his son Jesus. That's what makes heaven heaven. It's nothing less than being united with God. And that's why heaven is described as a place of perfect, unbroken relationship with him. Let me remind you again from Revelation. God's dwelling place is now among people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. One of the sad realities on the increase in our country is kidnapping for ransom. I think of the Moti brothers a few weeks ago, a long time ago now. Can you imagine how those parents must have felt when their four sons were kidnapped and taken away from them? Can you imagine the panic, the awful anxiety, that horrible thought that they may never see them again? This one had a happy ending, of course. They were reunited with their parents just this past week. Can you imagine the reunion? Perhaps those boys, as they saw their parents, would feel like they never loved them as much as they did at that moment. No doubt, parents' hearts bursting with sheer joy and relief. Well, that's nothing more than a glimpse of what heaven will be like. The agony of having been separated from your father will make the reunion all the more sweet. In that moment, your love for him will be greater than you can ever imagine it to be. Greater than it would have felt had you never been separated. And his love for you, demonstrated by the way he sent his son to search for you and to find you, will be seen for what it is, the greatest love you've ever known. The greatest joy you've ever experienced. In a sense, all of history has been the long, terrible story of mankind trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. We look to sex and relationships, to career, to our homes, our health, our sports, our holidays, to fully satisfy us. But we're far too easily pleased, as C.S. Lewis put it. Even the best of these things were not designed to bear the weight we try and put on them. And when we realize that, we're free to enjoy them for what they are and nothing more. And that means we won't burden our loved ones with unrealistic expectations that they can fill the hole inside of us. It means we won't expect our occupations or our achievements or our appearances to save us. We won't expect money to be our saviour. We were made for another world. One that's never ending. And that's where our deepest desires will be fully and finally met. In the one who made us restless until our hearts find rest in him. So let me ask you, is this God the one you live for? If not, which God are you living for? Did it create you? 
Does it sustain you? Can it be trusted? Does it make big promises only to leave you disappointed? How does it make you feel when you let it down? Does it make you feel free or make you feel enslaved? Has it fulfilled you? Has it lived like Jesus lived? Loved like Jesus loved? Has it laid down its life for you? Does it have an answer to death and has it proved it can deliver on those promises? What future does it offer you? Is your God as good as this God has shown himself to be? Revelation 22 makes a promise to all those who love Jesus. It says that in the new heaven and the new earth, they will see his face. How many of us have been haunted by the faces of those we've loved? Faces we've lost. Faces we've let go. Faces that despite our best efforts couldn't love us in return. Faces that have either been taken from us by time or circumstance or by death. But there is a face in heaven that will satisfy the ache of every broken heart. And the Bible promises that his people and his bride will see that face. The moment you see it, you'll know you've reached your true home. The moment you see it, you'll know that you've been searching for this face in every face you've ever loved. The best gift God can give you is himself. Let's pray. Help us to see the face behind this beautiful name we have sung of. Help us to see with greater and greater clarity in each day that it is him we were made for, him we were meant for, him who has made the offer to us all that we might be with him for all eternity. O glorious and everlasting God, help us to be driven by that hope in our lives each day that you might be glorified. Help those here this morning who do not yet see, to reach out their hand in surrender and to trust you, the trustworthy, joyful God, and find their lives changed, transformed forevermore. Thank you for Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen.